Hello and welcome to ENM TV. My name is Roy Shepard. Hope you've had a great first day of the Congress. So many sessions to attend. Normally when I talk to people, they say they're absolutely exhausted. I don't know how exhausted my first guest is, but a little bit later on in this program, we'll be talking about AI. But first, I've been joined by Ken Herman, who's the former chair of the Oncology and uh, Theranostics Committee here at e &M. Uh, What is Earl? So, it, it, excellent question. So, first of all, Earl is a wonderful abbreviation. It's something that uh, was recently actually established, uh, not so recently, quite a few years uh, recent, uh, established, uh, to standardize the way we use uh, certain techniques in nuclear medicine. So we're starting up with the, uh, with the standardization for PET imaging, uh, more recently spec and the newest thing I think is what you want to talk about is actually the first time that we have a certain standardization how we certify centers to do synostics. So why is this important? Because you, you'd think that it would happen naturally anyway. Yeah. So it, it, when you look at the growth of Thanostics in the last uh, uh, five to ten years, it's anything but naturally. It's actually really skyrocketing. We also have to admit that not every country has the same uh, tradition, the same history, uh, but we now see the expansion and demand skyrocket in all the different places of the world. So, so is, is this like guidelines light? No, no, it's, it's actually the, the demand of this new therapy is transformational. Transformational for what we do, also how we do uh, patient care. And now what we need to make sure is that the centers are ready. The centers need to be ready and we also want to guarantee a certain base level of preparedness. And the idea of the earth certification of diagnostic centers is to really, first of all, help centers to understand what is necessary and the second thing is also make sure that we can guarantee a certain base level at all the different centers all over the world. So these are centers of excellence effectively then? This is exactly, this is a, we, the, the, the concept overall is that we have a different levels of center of excellence. We have now launched today the, the first level of, uh, uh, of uh, synostic centers of excellence, the base level, which of course is a little bit easier than the other ones later on to qualify. But the main idea is really to give certain p uh, centers a guidance, what is necessary. And if they fulfill the requirements, they also get the stamp, they get the certification that they are center of excellence certified by Earl. Give us an idea of the difference between level one and level two. So the more, so level two has not been launched, so I'm not going to, to tell you too many details, but obviously level one is basic, which means a low, a low burden, a low barrier. A lot of people can qualify. It's easy to qualify. And the higher you go, yeah, the more you have to actually also provide from like uh, equipment, from uh, 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 personnel. And, and, and the idea behind this is that a lot of people should be able to provide therapies which are approved. But centers who really contribute to the development of new therapies, like early clinical trials, of course, we have a certain higher demand of that. And this is structure behind it. I mean, you know, we're talking about the, there, there isn't a harmonization and different countries have different levels of resource and expertise. Um, you said just now that level one is relatively easy. Is it relatively easy for every country that may not have access to the latest technologies? So, of, of, of course, when you look at this, it's obviously different. Every country is a little bit different. But the main idea we had is we want to provide something which lets everyone participate. That's where level one is rather simple. Of course, it's still a little more difficult in low-income countries than in high-income countries. But still, the likelihood that you can achieve it is much higher than, for example, level three. The main idea, and I think it's important, is like you said, is uh, uh, the, the, the circumstances, the background is different everywhere. But actually the patient need is not different everywhere. So, and what we try to do is actually to synchronize this. And we also want to make it uh, transparent that people can compare. And especially, I think, especially for countries where they have maybe a, a worse reputation because they are low-income countries, this certification can at least show them that they have managed a standard which is worldwide the same, independent if you are somewhere in the highest paid uh, part of New York or if you are somewhere in a very low income part of, let's say, Africa or Eastern Europe. All right. How would you like this to evolve in, say, three to five years time? What, what would you like it to look like then? So the, the first step right now is to talk about it, to make it available. We have already 50 centers who are reg registered. I'm a, let's say, a greedy person. I want 100, 200, eventually 500 centers in level one, right? This is the first important And milestone. this is global, not, not just it's absolutely, Europe. It's supposed to be global. It's, of course, driven from Europe, but we have, from the beginning, had the idea to make this not a European thing, but really make it open for everyone. And then, of course, we want to launch level two and level three, and 
coming back, what is my vision in five years? We want to really have a nice structure of level one, level two, level three centers, where also patients, but also industry partners, researchers know who is the right partner for me to, for example, launch a new clinical trial, or for example, also who are my partners when I want to launch a therapy post-approval. So how much of this is a push on the part of ENM, on, or how much of it is a pull from clini clinicians, researchers, and industry? So we, we all know that it's necessary. We all talk about it for a long time. And uh, ENM and Earl and uh, Eva and her team finally had the guts to do this. So we're not the only ones in the world. SNI has done a very similar initiative, but they are focused 100% on the US and kind of only the US only. Uh, um, and, and, and we try to do this actually more, more global to make it, uh, we start in Europe, we want to make it available to everyone. Regarding your question, is it more push or pull? It's actually both. It's push and pull. Uh, but right now we start with the push after we have experienced the pull. Okay, fantastic. I've seen so many initiatives like this in so many different disciplines. And at the very beginning, it's really important you create a magnetic field for it. And, and if there isn't that desire on the part of yeah. the participants, then it, it doesn't get off the ground. So what you're saying then is it's highly probable that it will actually, you know, evolve and develop in, in the years to come. This is our great hope. I really want to strongly encourage everyone who listens to us now to do this. It's fairly simple, especially level one. My own institution started uh, last Thursday, so like uh, <laughs> Very uh, three, three, doses, three or four days ago, uh, and we completed it within four, uh, 24 hours. So I think it's quite uh, feasible, it's quite easy. And again, uh, ENM, I think we have more than 7,000 attendees this year in Hamburg, right? I who think it's can, near 8,000 8, actually, even, yeah. You see, who, who is in a better position to do this, to scale it, than us? Now we have to do it. Okay, now let's just talk about the harmonization of PET and CT, uh, harmonization and theranostics especially yeah. in um, PSMA um, area. What's going on there and why is that important? I, this is, I mean, f for a couple of reasons, this is a topic uh, dear to my heart. So first of all, as you know, Earl, I mentioned before, had the origin actually in, in, in standardizing the way we read FTG PET and how we perform image acquisition. PSMA PET is definitely the next level, uh, but it's, of course, uh, one of the biggest areas of growth. Uh, I personally, for a couple of reasons, uh, am highly interested uh, one reason, first of all, is we need to make sure that when we perform a PSMA PET scan in the southern part of Germany, it has to be the same as in the northern part of Germany. Right? This is something very important, even for a country like Germany. Second thing is, I want us to report the way we do PSMA PET in a very standardized manner. So, uh, and it has to be simple. The clinician really wants this information, he pulls for the information, but if we come with a six, seven, eight, nine line of text, no one cares about it. So what we do right now is we standardize on one way, the way we do the image acquisition. This is what you talk about, how we do uh, uh, also yeah, take the advantage of Earl to make a certain standardization of the image acquisition. In the same time, we also make a standardization of the way we report PET. And these two things actually in parallel help us that eventually a patient, wherever he is in Europe or in the US or in the world, will get the PSMA PET scan in a very standardized fashion and is read in a very standardized fashion. Because at the moment, it's very variable, isn't it? So from a patient perspective, how will this help diagnosis and, and ultimately it treatment? It will help the patient, but especially also the clinician, the urologist, because uh, he knows now that, uh, uh, that, that if he gets a scan from center A or center B, it doesn't matter. They have the same way of communication established. I think this is very, very important. Right now, there are a couple of top centers, right? Where you have a top reader, but if a top reader is on vacation, or, uh, uh, or the center is closed for some reason, you all of a sudden have a different, complete different level of, of PET scan, a completely different, uh, a different level of report. And this, in the long term, is not sustainable. So what else is on your mind at the moment? I, I'm always amazed, actually, at the accelerated growth and evolution of so many aspects of, of nuclear medicine. There are two things I, I really care about. So one of them is that we really, as nuclear medicine, we need to embrace change. So uh, we need to accept, and this is what I find the most exciting about nuclear medicine, but we need to transport this to our people, is that we have to reinvent ourselves every two to five years. What I want to say is, diagnostics is now, PSMA is now, but this is just the beginning. We have to continue to grow, we have to continue to expand. And the second thing I care about is, uh, uh, we, we talk a lot about uh, patients, we talk a lot about the way we treat patients, 
especially in the part of oncology. And we need to embrace that we are now not only the guys who do imaging, we are now really treating physicians, which means we need to embrace oncology. And what I always say is we need to oncologize nuclear medicine. Do you find that the energy for the future is predominantly coming from young people in the profession or are the older, more experienced people sharing the same sort of enthusiasm or not? So I put it like this, we need the energy of the young people. If we don't have the energy of the young people, then it's only a question of time until we are redundant. So uh, are we there yet? Well, we have all the discussions, Generation Z and everything. I think uh, we should not worry so much or we should not spend so much time about uh, complaining and worrying. What we need to do is we need to encourage uh, 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 the people, motivate them and maybe also push them a little bit. But overall, we need the power, we need the energy and we need the, uh, the emotional investment of the young generation. Well, funnily enough, I was here in Hamburg in 2016, I think. So the number of people who attended this Congress was just under 5,000. So it's hovering around the 8,000. So something is definitely working. We are growing. But again, look, it's the same with the stock market. Right? Look, if you look at the numbers now, they already calculate in the growth of the next couple of years. The same as the stock market. If you look at the stock market, the, the value of a stock has already incorporated the, 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 all the successful things we all know about. What we need to do now is to actually trigger the next phase. We need to make sure that this 8,000 is sustainable. And that, like I said before, I'm a greedy person. Actually, I want to go to 10,000. We need to, we really need to grow our specialty. Greedy or ambitious? I would say it's ambitious, not greedy. But Ken, great to meet you. Thank you very much indeed for joining me today. In a couple of minutes' time, we'll be talking about artificial intelligence, a topic that is under a lot of consideration at the moment, and how AI can be aligned to nuclear medicine, stay with us.